I know we have a few people here that we call cliff dwellers. Those are the people who actually live in the Cliff May homes. Is there anybody, I know you live in the Cliff May homes and you do, anybody else here? All right. Hopefully I'll be able to tell you things you don't already know. How long have you guys lived in the neighborhood? Two years. 16 years. 16 years. That's a good tenure. <laughs> Four years, all right. All right, well, we'll get going here. Welcome to Harvey Park. This is a, actually Harvey Park back in probably 1956, an aerial photograph. And uh, what you're looking at here, you're looking toward the east. This here is Evans Avenue. We have Yale over here, or what will become Yale here. And this is Sheridan here, and then Federal here, if that gives you an idea of where we are in the city. So Harvey Park was built at a time of extreme growth in Denver, kind of similar to what we have here. And what's interesting is that um, Harvey Park's annexation into Denver was highly contested by the anti-sprawl people that you think are a recent phenomenon, but actually even in the 1950s, Denverites didn't want to see Harvey Park annexed into the city. Does anybody know what famous person originally owned the land that Harvey Park is built on? Paul Whiteman? You're right. Big band leader Paul Whiteman, whose fame is uh, hiring Gershwin to, um, to compose Rhapsody in Blue, but also was a very famous big band leader at the time. He grew up in Denver. His father was actually the director of music at Denver Public Schools. And when his father retired, Paul Whiteman bought this land for his father and mother to live on in retirement. And uh, they actually called it the Black and White Ranch, where they raised black and white farm animals. And I actually have a photograph here of what their house originally looked like. The house is actually still standing, but it looks vastly different today. The person who bought the house uh, after Paul Whiteman sold it did a huge expansion on it. It's, a, it's basically what we call a mansion now and changed the style to kind of a French style and it's pretty much unrecognizable from this, but the house is still standing. And in fact, if we zoom in a little bit in our aerial photograph here, uh, the Cliff May homes, which we'll be talking about, are right here. And they, there's nothing to the west of them, which means they were probably just finished when this photograph was taken. And the mansion, is right here, or where Paul Whiteman's original house was, is right here. And then again, just to give you your bearings, this is Evans here, and then we have Yale over here. So just to give you some of the typical style going on in Harvey Park, just to give you some context, Harvey Park was built at a time in which uh, you know, the story, as the story goes, you know, neighborhoods at this time were being built to house soldiers coming back. But that's not really the story behind Harvey Park. That was the Harvey Park's neighbor to the east, Burns Brentwood, was more built for that purpose. Harvey Park's purpose was to kind of take on the second wave, which was all of these soldiers having children and building families. And so what Harvey Park builders were looking to build was a good family home a, more, a higher quality home, a great neighborhood that people would want to lay down roots and, and raise their children in. And so a lot of these houses, which are all incidentally houses that were featured in various parades of homes through the years, um, because the parade of homes was similar to what they've been doing recently where there were houses all over the city that were part of the parade, and um, Harvey Park was featured in it a number of years from 54 to 56 and even beyond. And so these are kind of the typical houses you find in Harvey Park. Harvey Park has about 4,000 houses in it, actually 4,200 in total. And so you can see a lot of it are, the, are these brick bungalows, brick ranches, typical post-war style. But there were also about 10% of the houses built in Harvey Park are mid-century modern. This house is an example of a Carey holiday home. Lou Carey was a big Denver developer in the 50s and he built an entire section of Harvey Park in mid-century modern style. 
This house, unfortunately, has received some renovations that took out some of its mid-century modern elements, but I feature it because it was in the parade and because this particular house actually won recognition when it was built from Parents Magazine. It was considered the best home for children in the region when they built it. This is another holiday home. This one has had some unusual renovations as well. <laughs> um, and this is a much larger model they called the executive model that was marketed to young executives of the 1950s. And then this is a custom home in a section of Harvey Park called Lake Ridge. One interesting fact about Harvey Park is that it has the only two private lakes in the Denver city limits. And Lake Ridge is one of those two private lakes and actually um, or the lake is actually called Walcott Lake, but the section of Harvey Park is called Lake Ridge. And there are a number of mid-century modern houses, custom mid-century modern houses around that particular lake. So this is a photograph of Cliff May, the guy we'll be talking about a little bit today. And actually, there's this great book written by a guy named Daniel Gregory, who, as you can see, it's a very thick book about Cliff May and his work. But he kind of, I want to just read to you his introduction about Cliff May because I think he says it better than I could possibly say it. So instead of me plagiarizing him. Let me get to it here. All right, so just in this quick paragraph he describes, Cliff May was a vividly Western, multi-talented personality who began his career during the Great Depression. He was a horseman, a saxophone and piano player. He actually had his own big band called the Cliff May Band when he was in college in San Diego. Um, a dance band leader, a self-taught furniture maker, a house designer who never went to architecture school, a land developer, a canny home salesman, a fast driver who favored not Cadillacs but Lincoln Continentals, and a pilot of his own plane, which was naturally a bonanza. So that gives you an idea of, this, is a, this was a very interesting, charismatic man, very good at self-promotion. And because of that, he was quite famous and designed a lot of custom homes through his career for famous people. Um, in fact, there are famous people today who live in old Cliff May homes now, Ben Affleck to name one. Um, and, uh, but there was a period in his career in the mid-50s that he started designing these, um, the ranches that we have here in Denver, which I'll be showing you here in a minute. Um, and of course, here's one example of them. I thought I had one other slide. Oh, here's Cliff May and his family. This is another one of his houses, and I just, it's the most fascinating house of his, so I just wanted to share it. This is what is referred to as his experimental house. And what you'll notice is that there are almost no walls within the house. And I think the screen is cutting off a little bit at the top here, but... Uh, and the other thing is that this dashed line actually represented a skylight that could be open to the outdoors. So this next photograph is actually looking down into the house where the roof could actually be retracted and the outdoors could really be brought in. Here's looking from the same room, looking back up through the retracted roof there. This is... The back of the house, you can see it has kind of the characteristic clear story windows, but it also has an entire wall that could be opened up to the outdoors. Of course, these are things you can only really get away with in California. And this is the floor plan showing what he used to divide up rooms. These are actually cabinet units on wheels so that rooms could be reconfigured through the house at will. So, you know, in this floor plan, he has, the, he has bedrooms up here and, the, and another larger bedroom here, dining area, living area. But as you saw in that first floor plan, the floor plan could be completely reconfigured the next day because all of these cabinet units were on rubber wheels that could be moved around. Here's a photograph kind of looking through that children's bedroom area that was at the top of the plan. This is another house of his, just showing another example of rustic materials, this giant rustic fireplace in combination with a glass wall connecting the house to the outdoors. 
Um, this is an example, too, of in a lot of his big custom houses up at the peak, he would actually put a skylight that would run all the way down the peak. But then again, he has an antique light fixture from Spain instead of a globe light in his design. And another example here where he's using a post that's another antique from Spain rather than just a, uh, a square post that we would normally find in a mid-century modern house. And this is a floor plan of what he would typically design for his big custom home um, clients. And in this you can kind of get a sense of what his ins inspiration was through his entire career was the uh, Mexican ranches that were throughout Southern California and Northern Mexico that typically had a floor plan that surrounded a courtyard, had kind of a private outdoor space for families to gather, and he did a modern interpretation of that through this very sprawling ranch here, for example. So back to Harvey Park. This is an example of one of the other parade homes that I didn't show you in the last set of parade homes. This, is, this one's at 2500 South Lowell, actually 2505 South Lowell. And this is the house back in 1955 during the parade. It's kind of hard to see because of the, it was taken from the newspaper Microfish, but you can see over 60 years, not too much has changed actually, other than this tree is much, much larger as is this bush here, and the fence is different. But the ideas are still the same. These are a couple of ads, and unfortunately I think the projector is cutting off a little bit. I don't know if I can shift this here. These are a couple of Cliff May ads here. And it's interesting to see the wording that he used in his ads. And this is wording that was used in a lot of ads in the mid-50s where home builders were trying to do more than just sell a house. They wanted to convince you that they were selling you a lifestyle. So you see wording like this that, and it's cut off on the top, but it says, an adventure in living that's fun. Architect designed, expandability in the original design, new today, new for a lifetime which some current Cliff May owners may actually agree with. Your proudest possession. This kind of wording was typical, but Cliff May really went out to sell that to people. And here's a couple other ads. Another good headline, the home your dream built, designed by Cliff May. And this is a term that he often uses as advertising too, magazine cover home. And this relates to the fact that Cliff May was on, his, his work was on many magazine covers. And in fact, he had a very close relationship with Sunset Magazine. So close, in fact, that he wrote a book for them, um, which I actually have a copy here, and it's still in print, um, about his, his ideas behind ranch design. It includes a number of his projects from the 50s and 60s. He also designed their corporate headquarters, which they only very recently moved out of in Silicon Valley. And actually, the, uh, the fate of the building is as yet unknown. And a couple more ads here. Low-cost luxury, outdoor, indoor living, for you who want the newest. And to give you a little more context as well, a lot of the people who were buying in Harvey Park were buying there because they were working not too far away in what is now Lockheed Martin or Martin Marietta at that time, essentially rocket scientists. It was the closest neighborhood where you could live in the city but still, but still be near that particular facility. And so there were, they were really looking for these people who, who were looking for the cutting edge. And those were the kind of people who were buying Cliff May homes and other mid-century modern homes in the neighborhood. There's, this ad here also hints to a couple of the problems Cliff May encountered as he came into Denver. It says fireplace, and sure, storm windows, yes. One of the things he encountered is he had not actually planned on the fact that he might need to do double pane windows or find some way to add insulation to the houses. And so um, they had to take on an extra cost to add storm windows to the houses when they were built. Some of the houses still have their original sets of storm windows. Now to just bring one other name into it, 
Um, this guy is Frank Burns, and he was a big Denver developer for many years. In fact, the um, DU School of Real Estate is named after him. And him and his wife were both big donors to the university. His wife, Joy Burns, actually is still alive today, and she's also heavily involved with DU. And he ran his uncle's company. He took it over after his uncle passed away. The company is called DC Burns Realty. And if that name DC Burns sounds familiar, if you think about that park that uh, kind of near Cherry Creek that has the sculptures, the modern sculptures in the middle of a big lawn, that park is called DC Burns Park. But DC Burns was founded in 1899, and we actually recently learned that Joy Burns is in the process of closing it down this year. So it's actually a very old company, and even was an old company when they were building the Cliff May homes. But the way Cliff May worked is he didn't develop outside of California. He licensed builders in different markets to basically buy his houses and develop a neighborhood and put his houses on the land. Another photo of Frank Burns and his wife, Joy Burns. This is uh, this house, just to again give you some context, this is a Burns Brentwood house. This is the first set of houses that Burns is developing just east of Harvey Park before he built the Cliff May homes and others. They were kind of Levittown, if you're familiar with that, inspired houses, very small, affordable houses. He was also cutting edge in that he was one of the first realtors in the city to, or first builders in the city to um, take VA loans and offer those for home buyers. So here's a map here, as I was talking about, the various territories that Cliff May licensed to. Um, Burns is listed right here. What's interesting though is that it shows that Cliff May was actually the builder for Las Vegas, but we recently discovered that it was actually um, Frank Burns who developed the Las Vegas tract, which is the second largest tract outside of California. Denver's is the first. Um, Denver has 170 houses in it, and uh, Vegas has 120 houses, although Vegas is not it's near downtown and it's not in nearly as good condition as the houses we have here in Denver. Some other places where there are Cliff May homes outside of California, this is in Salt Lake. Beautiful backdrop here, as you can see. This is the Vegas tract, as you can see, an interesting backdrop of the strip behind the neighborhood there. This is in Kansas City, where there's just one block of Cliff May homes but they're all in relatively good condition, except for perhaps this one here where they decided to add an attic on top of the house. And this one's in Dallas. Um, that one's the third largest track with 56 houses. And if any of you are going to be in Dallas in mid-October, they're actually doing a home tour of their tract on October 15th. I'll be trying to fly out there for that. And now back to Harvey Park. And just to show you some photos of the Harvey Park houses here, you can get a sense of, of what Cliff May was bringing to these smaller houses where I showed you those larger custom homes where he was trying to create the indoor-outdoor connection with walls of glass and the courtyards and things like that. He tried to scale that down to a much smaller and more affordable house for Harvey Park and for other neighborhoods through the country. And so we have these smaller clear story windows here, which we, he called glass gables. We have the full height glass here, which this is some pretty typical style and rail wood windows. And he still brought rustic materials into it. If, if anybody looks at the beams up close, they're actually rough sawn, they're not very smooth. He used um, board and batten siding, either redwood or cedar, uh, cedar here in Denver. And this picture doesn't really illustrate it very well, but we'll see more later where these houses were. At least he created the courtyard effect by surrounding the houses with, large, with tall fences instead of being able to build the house around a courtyard, which just wasn't doable with the square footage we were looking at. These are some of the original brochures from the Cliff May homes, which I have some copies of on the back table here if you want to look at them up close. There were a total of six models offered, and there were two kind of variations that you could get. You could get what we nowadays refer to as the shotgun, 
which is just kind of a rectangle. Or you could get the L-shaped, where it was the rectangle, but then you had another wing for the master bedroom added on. This one here is the largest model, four bedrooms, larger living space than the rest of them. And I also put two plans next to each other here, and with it cut off, it's kind of hard to see, but basically what was happening here is the, the other part of the story is that these are modular houses, and we'll get into the details of that shortly. But as a result, there's a grid at work here, and this is a good example of their modularity. This house and this house have the exact same floor plan here. It's just the only difference is they added on this master bedroom wing by adding a wall right here, which created a hallway, and making this a smaller bedroom than this right here. And those are the, that's the only difference between the two houses is this master bedroom wing here. So here's a model of a Cliff May home with its skeleton exposed. And what you may notice is that these houses are built quite a bit differently than a typical house. These houses are not built with studs. They are instead built with pre-built panels that came from the factory. And these panels were constructed so that in, in a five foot module, so that they could just be brought to the site tilted up and a house could actually be, Cliff may prove that he could assemble a house in a day with the interior finish out taking a couple weeks after that. So this is a model that he built showing all the pieces and parts and how they could be reconfigured in whatever um, arrangement that you like. And so with this modular system and with the fact that all the structure is contained here in these beams that ride the kind of the outside of the house and then the main beam in the middle that are then supported by four by four posts, everything else you could change up however you wanted. If you wanted a whole wall of windows here, as long as you had one portion that had this X bracing that you see right here to, to support the house laterally, you could pretty much do whatever you want. Same is true for the interior walls. In a Cliff May home, you can take all the interior walls out of the home, as long as you keep the posts the house will stand up with no problem. So this is looking down on the model here. And this model here, I went to the Cliff May archive last year and actually dug through the many materials that they have on file there and they included this architectural model in their file, which was interesting to see in person. And so this shows you them putting a Cliff May house on site. This is not in Harvey Park. I've yet to find any construction photos in Harvey Park, unfortunately. But here they are starting to put some panels up and nail them down and nail them together. You can see them about to lift that panel into place. And part of the idea here too is that there's a regular grid of posts and these window units here, because these would have windows going in right here, actually have pieces that go all the way up, two by fours, so that when the two by four in this piece and the two by four in this piece come together, you essentially have a four by four post. So that was kind of the creative way that they implemented the structural system. And here's a panel here in the factory being constructed. And so after they would build these panels, they would flat pack them, stack them up. You can see they actually had the siding pre-installed so that when it went up, the, the, at least the boards, not the battens, were installed on the, on the exterior of the house already ready to go. And then they would, oh, that's a different kind of flat packing. They would load them on a big trailer like this and then ship them off to the site. I kind of did this here <laughs> because uh, Cliff May actually, and I'm just going to go through it real fast, he actually put together a step-by-step -step instruction manual on how these houses are assembled so that when they had it on site, they knew the order that all the pieces were supposed to go up. So I'll just go through that here. Step number one. And you can see that it shows to tilt up the, all the panels. And then here they're adding these individual posts. Where these posts went up is where eventually the windows, the floor to ceiling windows would go. They put the, the beams on top on the sides of the house. 
is the tops of the sides of the house have four by six beams, which some people have discovered trying to put electrical up to the roof. That, that's hard to do with a big beam there. Tie beams here at the ends of the house that make up the bottoms of the um, glass gables or the clear story windows. And then tie beams in the middle of the house here too. And these, these tie beams were nicely used to create soffits in the living room, which you'll be able to see in some of the photos I'll show you later on. The main beam in the middle, and then of course adding the roof on. And then just a few other steps, adding in the windows, adding in some ceiling support because this is a, typically like a storage room or a utility room in the middle of the house that has a lower ceiling. Everything else in these houses is vaulted ceilings. And then if you had the wing that I talked about, this is how you add it on. And this is actually a house in Harvey Park that somebody took all the drywall off of in order to add insulation. The walls in the Cliff May homes did not have any insulation originally. The ceilings did, but not the walls. And this is what the inside of an actual exterior wall in a Cliff May home looks like. So you see this is the solid panel that has the X bracing in it. This is the window panel that would have had those two legs going up. And there are these boards that go across here that um, both stabilize the panels but also provide um, a nailing surface so for adding the drywall and then also if you were hanging cabinets or something like that, the blocking is already in the wall for you to do that since you wouldn't have studs to nail into. And it would be very hard to figure out where these X's were. In case you're ever wondering about the authenticity of your Cliff May home, all you need to do is tear your drywall off and all of the, um, at least the solid panels, have this stamp on them. That says, if, if you're having a hard time reading it, protected by patent pending Cliff May and Chris Choate. I do have to sh throw a shout out to Chris Choate. He actually designed the system with Cliff May. He was an architect, so he was kind of the architect behind the project. But because Cliff May was the promoter, the, the big self-promoter, he gets all the credit for it. So Chris Choate is kind of the silent partner. This is, uh, again, we don't have construction photos of Denver, but here's a construction photo in Las Vegas of the Vegas tract that was also built by Burns Construction. And a, and a whole street here under construction, again in Vegas. So back to Denver. I like this piece by uh, Denver artist um, Kenny B. I don't know if you've seen this before. This is part of his neighborhood seed company project, but this is what he did for Harvey Park, giving a nice shout out to Harvey Park's mid-century modern architecture. And so this is a good example of what it's like to live in our neighborhood. Um, having such great indoor-outdoor living spaces prompts people to want to invite people over and have parties and socialize. And so there are a lot of these kinds of get-togethers that happen on a regular basis in these great outdoor living spaces and indoor spaces as well. Just one quick note in this photo here, this wall here is original to the house. All of them had this wall. Almost none of them have it anymore because everybody is tearing it out. <laughs> A quick question. Was that the original height? That is, this is the original height right here, yeah. Is that for all houses or just for some? My wall is higher up. Um, to my knowledge, it's for all the houses. But for instance, my house, because I live in one of these Cliff May homes, they had extended the wall all the way up to the ceiling at one point. And we've now torn it out. But yeah, originally in all the houses, it was at this height. Mine's about a foot high, um, taller. Really? Yeah, I'll talk, um, I actually have a couple of pictures. Yeah, that'd be interesting to see. This is an example of a house where that wall has been taken out. And this is part of the reason a lot of people are doing that is, particularly in a small house, it really opens things up. And of course, in the 1950s, kitchens were things that you hid. You didn't want your kitchen on display. It wasn't, as it's seen today, a social area to invite into the rest of the house. 
but it makes a huge difference to take that wall down and actually connect it to the rest of the house. This particular house has a tiki bar at it. If any of you attended our tour last year, this is where the tour headquarters was, was at this tiki bar, built under the back of somebody's garage. Another photo of the tiki bar. And part of what makes all of these great outdoor spaces possible is Cliff May's philosophy about how neighborhoods should be planned. This is actually from a document that Cliff May and Chris Cho wrote, arguing against what are called um, should I forget the term? Um, it was basically setbacks that were dictated by law that said that your house had to have certain setbacks from the street and from each other, which resulted in whole neighborhoods being built with houses perfectly in a row like this. In fact, pretty much all of Harvey Park is built like this. The exception to that is the Cliff May homes. And that's because Cliff May believed that homes should be laid out, even though it ends up being more expensive for the builder, they should be laid out in a way that living rooms aren't looking into living rooms, bedrooms aren't looking into bedrooms, and that when you look out a window in your house, you should not necessarily see the wall of the house next door. So as, as he lists here, laying out houses like this creates more space, more light, more air, more privacy, and more protection against sounds and noise. So not only does it create a more interesting and varied streetscape when you drive up and down the streets in Harvey Park, but for the people who are living there, it actually has a real meaningful um, effect on the quality of life in the neighborhood. And it creates these great outdoor spaces, which Cliff May kind of illustrates here in, in kind of an accept, a, a, a conceptual drawing that he did here of what it might look like. And this is very similar to how the houses in Harvey Park are laid out. Some are way in the back of the site, some are in the front of the site, some are turned 90 degrees. But all of them, there, there aren't really any houses that are laid out the same way right next to each other. And it's interesting, we got a, William Logan, the guy who runs Modern in Denver magazine, got a question from California recently, a woman who lives in one of the tracks in LA, who, I don't know why she was asking him, but her question was, why does it seem like a Cliff May home doesn't have a proper front door? And that actually was intentional. One, because it's a modular house, so you had the flexibility to make whatever door you want your front door. But it also made it so that no matter how the house was turned on the site, 360 degrees, you always had a door that could be used as the front door instead of defining in the plan, this is the front door, and then having to place the house on the site to always have that be the front door. And in fact, to some houses in Harvey Park, the front door is not facing the street, it's on the side of the house, and then you know the pathway in the yard leads you to where the front door actually is. And I just threw these in here because they're interesting, um, and apparently somebody didn't get this memo, but it says, uh, Chris, and this is to Chris Choate, in plot planning the houses for the Denver area, you can't have a driveway or garage on the north side what happens is the ice freezes and the car skids into the garage and it's just a taboo thing to do. <laughs> Unfortunately, we still ended up with driveways facing the north and those people do, in fact, I think you're one of them, struggle with ice every winter. Another memo here referring back to those storm windows that I mentioned. Um, back then, the set of storm windows for each house was costing them an extra $300 which doesn't sound like much now, but actually that was a huge amount to have to shell out to add that extra storm window. And unfortunately the storm windows aren't that attractive either, so a lot of people don't put them on. So Harvey Park has really seen, um, in the 12 years I've been living in there, seen a real revival. A lot of people really putting a lot of money into their houses to bring them back to what they probably originally were, maybe even better than they were built in the 50s. So you'll notice that, and, you know, I'll probably just quietly go through some slides and periods here just to see, you know, just to show you what's been happening in the neighborhood here. This is a good example of, of taking advantage again of that private outdoor space. This particular house, they turned their carport, at one point it was turned into a garage which then the next owner turned into an actual living space by putting these sliding glass doors on the side. 
This is that same house here at night. Here's a backyard chicken coop, inspired again with the glass gables, inspired by the design of the houses. And I just show this picture here. This is kind of a typical master bedroom in what we call the shotgun models. And I read that ad earlier that said that expandability was built into the plan. Well, one of the ways they did that is in this bedroom here. Um, this soffit here actually represents in the L-shaped models where the hallway is. And so if in the future you had one of those non-L-shaped models, or the shotgun models as we call them, if you wanted to add on, your option to do so would be to put an opening here in this wall. You put a wall here underneath this tie beam, and you already have a hallway, and you're good to go. You just build your addition onto it. Uh, yeah, all the houses, I believe, had these built-ins that kind of rested on top of this return for the heating system. Um, and originally, those utility closets, they all just basically were storage and had a hot water heater in them. Um, a lot of people recently, though, have actually managed to put washers and dryers in them. And probably part of doing that was perhaps taking these built-ins out. Um, some people in these models as well have managed to actually, in this... <laughs> in the space that this closet is, because actually this is a closet that's behind another closet in the living room, have actually managed to put a small bathroom in here to add another bathroom, particularly to the one bathroom houses. And here's an example of where somebody actually took advantage of that spot where you could put an opening in the wall and add a hallway to put an addition on. This particular addition spans the garage and the house. And so I, I promised some of the Cliff May owners that I would also show them some of the ways that Cliff May actually approved having changes to the house. I called it, what would Cliff May do? Um, and so these are approved changes that he actually had intended these for his, his licensed builders, so different options that they could offer. But since they're not building him anymore, it at least gives us ideas as to things that could be done as well. One example here is because these are modules, modular, you could always add one module on either end. If you wanted bigger bedrooms, just add another five foot module and your bedrooms are five foot longer. Or if you wanted to add more living space, again, add another module here or another module here, wherever you see fit, as long as you're sticking with that grid. This dash line incidentally and all of his plans represent the eaves under the roof. The Cliff May homes actually have particularly deep eaves that are exactly half a module, so two and a half feet instead of the five foot module. And what's great about those eaves is that because they're so deep, a lot of the houses still have their original 60 year old cedar siding because water never touches it. Here are some just examples of if you extended out the living room, different ways that you could build an entrance, again, following the grid. So you expand the, the dining room here, and then you have a little entrance foyer area, as it were. This shows how you could expand the house two modules out, but not actually enclose it, and have a large covered patio. That would still be architecturally appropriate. This shows how you could expand the very small Cliff May bathrooms. And this is kind of an interesting recommendation because it gets rid of that eave, at least at the bathroom, but recommending actually taking advantage of that two and a half feet under the eave to make the bathroom longer. And he kind of demonstrates a couple of ways that could be done here and then the ways the bathroom could be reconfigured as a result. This is a different example of how the kitchen could be arranged. You know, normally the kitchens were built with a dining room here and then a small galley kitchen here. In this example, he's showing an eat-in kitchen. And this is a more wild example here. Again, because none of the walls are structural, you can pretty much put a wall wherever you want as long as you support the wall properly. So he shows four by four posts at the end which would support the wall. 
and then also different configurations for how carports or garages could be added on to the house. Some of the houses in the neighborhood do have these carports or garages extending them out architecturally. Other houses, actually most of the houses have detached carports or garages. And they also shows different variations where you have a detached garage, how you could still architecturally connect that carport or garage to the house using a breezeway. So he shows here extending the roof to, to line up with the roof of the garage and then leaving an open breezeway in the middle. Another variation on that with the garage turned. This variation is kind of the same idea, but then he's suggesting just leaving it open, leaving the breezeway open, so that these are just exposed rafters here up above. And then different ways that those open rafters could be configured architecturally. And then we actually have a few of these in Harvey Park showing another method that the garage in the house or the carport in the house could be connected just using these horizontal rafters. And we'll see a photo later of a house that actually has this. Do you know how, um, how many have that? I don't know offhand. No, it'd be interesting to find out actually. And then some variations on that too where you could actually do a grid or if you were on a hill, which none of our houses are, you could step it down to the garage. And then a very dramatic way that it could be connected, showing kind of, an, incidentally, this grid here that he's drawing lines up with the, that five-foot grid of the house to keep things architecturally cohesive, but a way in which this would provide just a path kind of between the garage and the house visually. And here's actually a rendering of how something like that might look. So it's more for drama than cover or protection. But he does also show ways that you could add cover to it by adding boards on top, bamboo poles, different patterns you could use. And then even if, if you wanted some kind of meaningful cover, adding canvas on top. Although he even notes in his notes here that it's something that would have to be replaced on a regular basis. Welcome back to Harvey Park. <laughs> and I think I took this photo, I don't know how many years ago now, maybe eight years ago. Um, and it makes it, Harvey Park look a lot worse back then than it really was, although this is, was a real thing across the street from my house. but. Even looking at the house behind, this is actually what most of the houses looked like when I moved in 12 years ago. So the transformation in these last 12 years is real to what we have now today. So here's an example of where somebody actually took advantage of the space under the eave to expand a bedroom. Although I'm not sure that's actually what Cliff May recommended, but. A dramatic carport photo. But this is actually a very good example of a carport, minus the fancy gate in front. This is what a typical carport would have looked like when the neighborhood was built. All of them are supported by the typical 4x4 posts, a roof that matches the same angle as the house, and a little storage shed in the back of the carport. So even a lot of the carports that have been converted into garages still have a storage shed in the back of the garage that people just left because it's actually up a few inches from the ground, which you're typically supposed to do to keep wood from touching the ground. This house is my house, although we've done a lot of changes to it since this photo was taken. And that's my dog. Here's an example of, some, of a house where a lot of drama was created by actually getting rid of the 
signature um, style and rail windows and replacing them with just full lights of glass. It makes it a very transparent house, really connecting the indoors and the out. And this is the same house from a different angle. Here's an example of where I was showing where we have those horizontal rafters there creating just a, a, a suggested ceiling, I guess. You know, it doesn't provide any real protection, but it makes it feel like your outdoor space is part of your living space. It's your extended living room by having this virtual ceiling up above. Again, you can see the transparency here, and that's, that's there in all of these houses. And if you can believe it, in the 80s and 90s, a lot of these houses had their floor-to-ceiling windows removed and replaced with just normal half windows. Some people have actually gone to the effort of putting them back, thank goodness, because it just it destroys the, the beauty of the house when people do that. Here's one that really has a lot of this glass. You can really see the transparency in that one, in this one here. You're really living in a glass house here, so no throwing stones. Another opened up kitchen. An example of a kid's bedroom. I have a six year old, although this isn't his bedroom, this is somebody else's house. But I love that even in the small bedrooms that we have, because of these vaulted ceilings, there's a lot of volume. It makes the room feel very big. Also, even though these windows look small, because they're on that five foot module, these are five foot wide windows. Each of the bedrooms has two of these, which means you really have 10 linear feet of window, not including the glass gable that's in the end bedrooms, bringing in light. So, and even this is a middle room, so this one would only have a five foot window, but that's actually a really big window and it lets in a lot of light, even though it looks small in context. This one's very modded out here. And actually the, uh, the owner of this house, when I took this photo, no longer lives in the neighborhood, unfortunately, but he was a, a big collector and, and picker in town and had a lot of great stuff in his house. Was that uh, Nick Horvath? No, no. Actually, Nick lived in a holiday home. This guy's name was Bill, but I don't remember his last name. Bill Nelson. That may be it, yeah. This is one where they kept, they actually lowered a portion of that kitchen wall and then raised the other portion of the wall creating its own architectural element here. This is just a quick detail. This is one of the original light fixtures. So if any of the Cliff May owners here in the house have one of these, either inside or outside their house, that is an original light fixture. And in the dining room, this one is actually in a Cliff May dining room. Because the dining rooms are so small, Cliff May didn't put in any chandeliers. Instead, your light was supposed to come from this little sconce on the wall. A lot of people have gone back to trying to get chandeliers into the ceiling anyway because the sconce doesn't really cut it. One other interesting note is uh, I found this great document, which I'll have to share online at some point, that had all of Cliff May's guidelines for how model homes should be staged. And one of the guidelines that he gave was that all of these sconces were actually supposed to be pointed up at the ceiling. Cliff May was actually very obsessed with light. That's why his, his walls, or his, his houses have so much glass. But it's also um, why he required these to be pointed up to create indirect light and why even in these soffits, which hopefully I'll have a good photograph to show you those, there was lighting installed in those soffits so that the ceilings would be washed with indirect light, particularly in the living room. Here's another example of a dining room with sconces, although these sconces aren't original. This is one of the master bedrooms where somebody has added paneling. None of the houses had paneling like this, unfortunately, but it looks awesome. A Cliff May bathroom, an interesting note, all of them were originally built with a five foot wide window 
in the shower. <laughs> Some of them have their bathrooms facing the street. So I don't know how the people who have those feel about that, but somebody had taken ours out in my house, so we don't have it. And Mike, I'll add one thing. The uh, frosted glass doesn't work very well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So here's an example of the soffits I was talking about, where I showed you where we had the, those construction drawings where they had the tie beam going across. So in all the houses where that tie beam is, there's a soffit up above, and in that soffit, all the houses were originally built with lighting up here. So you can see the lighting is actually turned on here, the lighting is bouncing off of the ceiling, and that was all Cliff May's notion of enhancing the interior environment through that indirect light in the soffits and then also using the sconces for that. Uh, quick, do you mind all these questions? During no, I don't mind. Okay. Do, do you guys mind the questions? I can have, I can, we can save them for later, but okay. The light on the left hand side, did he do, um, normally light both sides or just the one in the kitchen? He did normally light both sides. And if you have an original kitchen, what you would have had, and this one doesn't have it, you would have actually had an eight foot long frosted lens so that you'd have light coming down and going up and bouncing off the ceiling. But then on this side, it was just a light bouncing off the ceiling. And actually what's funny though, is the two sides were on separate switches, partially because you had this wall, you had this wall here, so there would be no reason you'd turn them both on and off at the same time. Again, this is a house where paneling was added later. Also, this house would have had open, the, the soffits here opened up, but some people actually closed them up and created storage in them. This house is kind of interesting too because they modified the ceiling of the house to make it look like it's a house in California. The Cliff May houses, particularly in Long Beach, actually had um, tongue and groove roofs where the roof deck is actually tongue and groove wood. And the underside of that is, of course, a beautiful tongue and groove ceiling. Um, but it doesn't provide much insulation. Uh, the best you can do is put some rigid foam on top of it. So they didn't do those kinds of roofs in, in Denver. Plus, you have some structural issues. Um, so this house actually has its original roof that has a rafter, plywood on the top, and uh, drywall on the bottom. But they added these tongue and groove boards and these false beams to make it look like it's a house in California. But it actually does seem to enhance the space to have this regular pattern of beams here. Again, this is from the inside looking out, that transparency again, that indoor-outdoor connection. And you'll probably also notice in a lot of the photos that there are doors everywhere. So there's a door here, this particular house's front door is on the end, and again, part of that is so that you have easy access into your outdoor living spaces. Oop. And my last few here, um, there was an article published in Modern in Denver recently that I wrote about the Cliff May homes in Harvey Park. I actually have copies in the back that are free for you to take. These are photographs from that article. So this is a very nice uh, exemplar of a house here where um, they really have the transparency and the clear stories and open spaces and all the things that these houses are about. Um, and it's interesting, the, the couple who bought this house, it took them, I'd say about a year and a half or so. When they got the house, it looked nothing like this. Um, it had a very southwestern feel, a lot of the glass had been covered up. Of course, it had the wall around the kitchen and felt very dark and closed in, and they really opened it up. The house was also built with a great addition originally, and so this is a photograph actually taken from within the addition, where they actually do have one of those tongue and groove roofs in the addition, and they went to all the trouble to take the paint off of it and stain it, and it looks amazing. But you can see here, this is where, these posts here are where a, a windows would have originally been, but they opened it up so that it's just a, a open extension of their living room.
And this is looking back into that addition here. The addition also has these nice little clear story windows here between the beams. So it was a very architecturally appropriate addition. And this is a kitchen in the same house. These incidentally, I put the photo credit here, but it's cut off. These are not my photos. A photographer named Daniel O'Connor shot these last few photos here. The rest of them are my photos. This right here yeah, um, was originally an indoor barbecue. Um, for whatever reason, these indoor barbecues, they were popular in the 50s and 60s, but for some reason they never quite worked properly. Most people have taken them out. This is an example where they took it out and put a TV in its place. And that, I'm going to leave it there. I'm happy to take any of your questions or chat with anybody later. I'll also be hanging out over in Adrian Kenny's booth here for a lot of the day if you don't want to wait in the crowd here. But um, I also have a few business cards in the back too that you're welcome to take and contact me by email or whatever if you have questions or curiosities about the Cliff Mayhomes. Thank you.